Hello, welcome again to our ongoing discussion on drama and theatre. Please uh, quickly recall what we did uh, in the previous class. We discussed uh, modern drama and before that we discussed uh, origins of drama, Greek origins of drama and we went through Roman drama, Elizabethan drama and all that. Okay. So, in this class uh, uh, you know based on our understanding of that if I can ask you a question you know can you or can me or can, he, can any literary historian uh, precisely pinpoint the exact moment or the place where modern drama was born. Do you think uh, we are up to the task? Do you think we can grab the challenge and answer that? Well, a couple of literary historians have done that and in fact, they have identified not just the exact date moment, they have also identified the place in which modern drama was born. Okay. To give you an answer to that question, modern drama was born on December 4th in the evening in the year 1879. Where was it born? Well, it was born in one of the theatres in Copenhagen. A little more dramatically speaking, it was born towards the evening while a play was being performed in a theatre in Copenhagen, you know, especially when the play was towards its, uh, you know, reached its climax the modern drama was born. Therefore, there are two dates December 4th when the play was first published and for the wider audience to reach you can even call December 21st 1879 when the modern drama was enacted you know. The drama in question is Yet Du Kem, a Norwegian drama published uh, you know by a writer who was not very very well known of course, even before this particular play he had written a couple of plays, but uh, this particular play called Ed Duquem in fact, this inaugurated the modern drama you know. So, please remember these three things Ed Duquem a Norwegian play December 4th 1879 when it was published and December 21st 1879 when it was uh, staged for the first time in Copenhagen. These are very important dates and names. Though the playwright had written several plays before this, if there was one play that catapulted him onto you know the world stage, this was this particular play. Why? What was so significant here? Because the protagonist of the play Nora during the climax, you know she just slams the door behind her leaving her husband, respectable marriage and lovely children. And why does she leave such a beautiful house? Well, of course, she leaves in search of an uncertain future because she wants to discover her own self. Does it happen or did it happen in the 19th century? Of course, this is what the play did. And for the first time, the play in a very daring way, you know, it uh, uh, performed an anatomy of social, psychological, cultural, emotional and moral truths beneath the placid surface of, uh, you know, respectable marriage that happened for the first time. And as I said, you know, literary historians have identified three golden points. Uh, when it comes to history of drama, of course, the first time is when you have uh, you know the, the triumvirate publishing their plays and when they were getting enacted in the ancient Greece, the classical Hellenic period that is the first golden point. The second golden point comes uh, when Shakespeare arrives onto the stage and you know when his plays are being performed and the third golden moment or watershed moment comes with Ibsen's publication of Ed Duquem. Well, is not it so strange that we are discussing a Norwegian play? Not really because this play is one of the most performed plays after Shakespeare. In fact, Ibsen is one of the most performed playwrights and uh, probably you and I may have heard of the play in English, it is called A Doll's House especially uh, in the year 2006 and 16, this was considered one of the most performed plays something like that. Therefore, Doll's House becomes a very, very important 
uh, play for us and Henry Kimson becomes an extraordinary writer. Let us go ahead and take a look at uh, a little bit of context, the writer and all that. Henrik Johan Ibsen was a Norwegian playwright, we have already identified that, but uh, he is a playwright who is uh, perennially in a state of exile, because even while in Norway it is said that he was constantly in exile, you know. And uh, he was a kind of a restless soul, remember literature is born out of some kind of a creative unrest. Therefore, he did not conform to uh, the moral prescriptions of society, he always questioned society and wanted to you know create some new paths and in fact, it said that uh, on his deathbed the last words that he seemed to have uttered were on the contrary, of course, in Norwegian on the contrary. What a befitting uh, epitaph for a writer who shook uh, uh, the entire society out of its complacency, right? you know on the contrary that is the last words of uh, the writer. Because of his contribution he is considered as the father of modern drama and more than that within that you know there is a genre of drama called uh, realistic drama. He seemed to have inaugurated this particular type of drama therefore, he is rightly called father of uh, realism. Okay. And uh, well he belongs to uh, those rare category of writers who had extraordinary talent and potential to get Nobel, but uh, did not get it for political reasons, right. So, remember more than those writers who got Nobel, we have been uh, busy reading those writers who had all the potential to get Nobel, but could not get it or did not get it for various political reasons and this guy too uh, was nominated several times for Nobel, but uh, he missed it. Well, some of his uh, well known works include An Enemy of the People, of course, you may have read, you may have watched the movie An Enemy of the State, this is Enemy of the People. More than that, A Doll's House, in fact, if there is one play that has brought an extraordinary name and fame to the writer, this is A Doll's House. But when it comes to artistic merit, you have Hedda Gabler, Ghosts and The Master Builder. They, in terms of uh, exquisite uh, dramaturgy, uh, craftsmanship, uh, you know, they are remarkable plays. Well, uh, he created a lot of unrest in society because when Doll's House was first published, if there is one play that was discussed widely, even in the non theatre circles, undoubtedly it is Doll's House because. Well, the ending was scandalous, nobody even accepted the ending. In fact, one of the leading uh, lady actors who was supposed to perform the role of uh, Nora in Germany, she refused to play the role. In Germany, she refused to play the role and therefore, they even wanted to change the ending. But of course, uh, uh, Ibsen almost protested, right. And it is said that uh, uh, during those times, especially in Norway and Italy where he was staying and even in Germany, you know, uh, where during social gatherings usually you send out an invite, right. Well, on the invite, you know, towards the end of it, P.S. you are requested not to discuss a doll's house when you come to the party. So, a special mention of you know not to discuss a doll's house. Now, you can imagine the kind of disturbance this play must have caused to the so called comfort of society or the elite you know something like that. So, as one of the literary critics later remarked it almost you know gave a shock value to European society to such an extent that probably Europe required many decades to recover from the shock that uh, uh, a doll's house gave something like this. And uh, as we have already said Ibsen is the most performed dramatist probably next only to Shakespeare and in a couple of years a doll's house was the world's most performed play you know. So, this is I guess this should uh, suffice to create an interest in you and I am sure you should be really tempted to go and read the play, please do that. Of course, uh, these classes are no substitute for not reading it, remember the interest the purpose is to pique your interest in that. Let us go 
uh, take a look at. These are a couple of uh, interesting things that uh, Ibsen says, you know. It is the very mark of the spirit of rebellion to crave for happiness in this life. Well, if you really want happiness in this life, that is the most daring act of rebellion you could be making. And now look at this, this you, you may have read in uh, many visiting cards or more than that greeting cards and all that. Money may bring you food, but not appetite. It can buy you medicine, but not health. Well, of course, money can definitely buy you acquaintances, but not true friends, something like that. Uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, playwright, more than that, uh, you know, uh, uh, a conscientious writer who did not compromise on the integrity of the writer even towards the end. Well, he had to pay a lot of, uh, you know, a heavy price for not uh, compromising on to his ideals, for his ideals. Well, of course, he was still happy with that, you know, a, a great writer, writer with uh, great integrity, uh, a rare breed, especially these days to come by, right. Let us go ahead and take a look at uh, a Doll's House, this remarkable play. Uh, while you keep contemplating on uh, the title, the title itself is slightly unique, right? A Doll's House. What is the doll here? What is the house? Of course, the entire title, not just the title, the entire play is replete with uh, symbolic meaning. So, I mean, the more you dig, the more layers of meanings you discover in the play. Let us go take a quick uh, look at the play, okay? Uh, this is just a background and uh, we identified that it was first uh, written in Norwegian. This is the first manuscript. What you have there is a, a photocopy or an excerpt from the first manuscript, probably in the writer's own uh, handwriting. We do not know that for sure, but definitely the first appearance. Okay? And we have also identified that it premiered on 21st December in 1879. Uh, by Ibsen and this is a play in three acts. Usually, uh, you know, until that point of time you saw plays with five acts, a full fledged play with five acts and uh, you know, he also seemed to have though not, uh, you know, introduced a three act play. Of course, he popularized it, Ibsen popularized it. Well, it is said that a doll's house is based on the life of uh, Laura Keeler, a uh, friend of uh, Ibsen, but we do not need to concern ourselves with that, right? Because uh, if a play would, uh, yeah, there might be several reasons behind the birth of a play, but uh, or, or, or art, you know, but an art, any artistic piece does not, uh, you know, stay put in the place it is born. It always grows to become universal, right? It is born locally and, you know, grows to become universal, you know, grows universally, something like that. That is why we read all these things. And as I said, it created a storm and outraged the modesty of the Victorian uh, values of marriage and family. That is the reason why, of course, it went on to acquire a, a kind of infamy in the beginning, but later, of course, extraordinary fame. And uh, many critics have also identified it as, you know, probably after, you know, uh, uh, media and uh, Antigone during the classical period of Greece, if there was one play that championed the cause of women, it is undoubtedly Ibsen's uh, uh, A Doll's House, you know. If there is one play that championed the cause of women and gave an impetus to uh, various waves of feminism, you know, then of course, undoubtedly it is uh, Ibsen's Doll's House. Yeah, we are going to discuss, uh, you know, especially this much talked of uh, the last scene where Nora closes the door on her husband and children because a particular critic says that, you know, she may have closed the door on her husband and children, but she opened a new door to the turn of centuries women's movement, you know. So, the door she may have closed opens a new door for feminism, you know, something like this. Now, uh, let us take a quick look at uh, major characters in the play. These are major characters. You have Nora, the protagonist. In fact, uh, as I said, if there is one strong uh, uh, female characters in the history of drama, probably after the Greek period, it is only in Ibsen's uh, Doll's House, a very strong uh, female protagonist. Okay. So, Nora is a very uh, well known and almost a legendary uh, protagonist that we have in uh, uh, literature drama. 
Well, her husband treats her as a doll and of course, uh, she seems to be okay with that initially, but uh, a moment of self reckoning comes and therefore, she refuses to stay within that confine Nora. And you have uh, in Torval Hammer, Nora's husband, okay, supporting character, but more than that he is a very flat character, you know a static character or a flat character. Think of our discussion on flat characters. Uh, initially he was a lawyer, but when the play begins, uh, we hear that uh, he is uh, he has been made a bank manager and uh, you know he has certain plans for the family and all that Torval Hammer. We have Dr. Rank a supporting character, a major character because through Dr. Rank uh, Ibsen explores uh, uh, many of his uh, pet themes especially you know genetics, the concept of platonic love and all that. So, a major character supporting character and so is Mrs. Christine Lind, uh, a close friend of uh, Nora. Of course, both Dr. Rank uh, is a family friend, he is first a friend to Torvald Hammer, but later he is drawn towards Nora and Christine Lind is an old friend of Nora who is a widow and uh, once she is romantically also involved with the antagonist of the play Niels Krogstad. So, Niels Krogstad is a uh, uh, an antagonist here. He is an employee in the bank where Tor Torvald is about to be the manager, but uh, the play discusses, this, uh, discusses him as having morally corrupt character in quotes, because later when the play ends we know that there are more morally depraved characters than Niels Krogstad that we are going to discuss. But for our understanding of characters, we have identified protagonist in Nora, antagonist in Niels Krogstad and Towel Hammer, a flat character, Dr. Rank and Mrs. Christine Lind. Christine Lind can also be a confidante character because Nora confines, confides many things in uh, uh, Christine Lind. Okay. Let us go ahead and uh, jump into uh, the setting. This is uh, a play that the entire play dramatic action takes place in just uh, the house of uh, hammers, you know, especially in the drawing room or in the living room. And therefore, it maintains the three unities that we discussed in uh, the Greek context, you know, unity of action because action takes place at a particular place, unity of time, it happens in a span of three days, you know. Again, that is very interesting, uh, you know, the play is set in the backdrop of Christmas Eve and the second act uh, begins on Christmas day and probably third act begins on a day after Christmas, you know just three days. And then you have unity of time, unity of action and unity of plays. Of course, uh, the entire play is set in the living room of Hemmers, this is something that, that can be kept in mind. For our general understanding, let us take a quick look at uh, uh, how the plot progresses from act to act. When the scene begins, which is act 1, you know, we see Nora uh, in a very, uh, very jovial state because she is decorating her house and a porter has just entered and delivered her a Christmas tree because the next day is Christmas, she is decorating, she has brought some gifts, but of course, she hurriedly hides those gifts so that you know she does not spoil the surprise for kids and of course, her husband uh, Emmer. And when she is busy doing all that, uh, her husband uh, walks in and then looking at all the gifts that she has bought almost in a very romantic way, he chastises her. He, I mean he calls her you know my little skylark, my little squirrel, my darling and all that. So, when the play opens, uh, uh, you see them almost, uh, 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 I mean the picture that you get is it must be a romantic couple, you know something like that. Uh, and of course, uh, this Christmas is also special for them because uh, it has announced that you know earlier until that point of time the family was you know uh, a lot of financial crisis was there in the family. Now that uh, uh, Torval is about to be made the bank manager, the dark days are left behind. So, therefore, they are also celebrating uh, Torval's promotion as a bank manager. So, when they are busy doing this, we are introduced to the two supporting characters Mrs. Lind and Dr. Rank. They are family friends you could say and Mrs. Lind is a confidante character and they have not met in fact, especially Christine that is her first name uh, of Mrs. Lind. So, she has they have not met each other for many years, right. So, now she says that uh, she is a widow now and uh, 
in order she has enough money, but probably in order to uh, you know uh, while away time she needs a good job and she is also educated. Therefore, Nora promises fine let me ask my husband if I can get you a job in his uh, office you know. Uh, that is precisely what happens in act 1 when it begins and then what happens uh, we find uh, uh, you know Nora revealing a long held secret of course, it is a confidante character it I mean also uh, the writer employs a foreshadowing technique here. Nora tells uh, uh, confides in uh, uh, Mrs. Lind that you know she has done a blunder because earlier about 6, 7 years ago Torvald was in very bad shape his health had deteriorated like anything and he also did not have enough money no good job and all that. During such times without informing her husband she has borrowed money from someone else and without of course, letting uh, her husband so far does not know because somehow she has been managing. Her husband she is under the impression that her husband is very you know morally upright character who does not encourage uh, neither borrower I mean do not be a borrower nor be a lender be uh, something like that. He wants to be financially independent and all that therefore, without informing him she is uh, earning some small I mean money from some odd jobs and repaying the debt that she has taken 7 years ago. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Christine uh, or just her uh, fr friend to inform her husband, but she says no this may not be right time and all that. Okay. While they are speaking we are introduced to uh, the antagonist of the play Niels Krogstad. Remember he is an employee in the same bank what has happened there uh, well Torvald does not like uh, Niels Krogstad therefore, the moment he has assumed charge he is about to fire Niels Krogstad. Okay, he is about to fire Niels Krogstad because he thinks Krogstad is morally corrupt and uh, even the presence of such a character in his bank might uh, spoil the morale of his uh, fellow characters and you know fellow employees therefore, he wants to dismiss him and uh, uh, Niels Krogstad has come to request him not to do that. But he also has uh, some other purpose which will be later revealed you know. Uh, and uh, by then of course, uh, what happens uh, uh, Nora has requested her husband to you know uh, uh, give a job to her friend Christine and of course, her husband also agrees. So, that is when uh, everything happens and while this is happening there you find Krogstad entering he has already finished speaking with uh, uh, Torvald and Torvald has not agreed to retain him and now he has come to meet Nora. Well, this is where the curiosity builds why has he come to meet Nora. Well, in the conversation that follows we learn that you know Nora 7 years ago borrowed money from Krogstad you know it was this guy that uh, she had borrowed money and now she is about to repay the entire amount maybe some amount is let uh, I mean left and she is about to repay. Now, he requests her that you know you will have to help me retain my job because I have my kids if your husband removes me from the job then the kids will be you know thrown to the street and uh, you know I mean the, the entire family will be will have to come onto the street and all that. But she cannot promise anything that is when he blackmails her he says that he is going to reveal a secret. What is the secret that it is not just that Nora has borrowed money from him as a surety because when you are borrowing money you have to give surety right. She has forged the signature of her dying father. Her father was about to die or, or had just died. She forged her father's signature to borrow money from Krogstad and Krogstad tells her tells her that he knows that particular secret and he is going to expose the entire family. So, now this puts uh, some kind of tension of course, you can spot Freytag's various models more of it in the next class. Well, uh, in act 2 of course, uh, now it is the Christmas day and everything is in a very happy mood now of course, uh, Nora now she is scared now because it is a happy family she does not want Krogstad to spoil the uh, you know uh, the bonhomi that uh, they share with each other. She tries to persuade Thorwell her husband not to fire him in fact, Thorwell Hemmer is uh, very much uh, disturbed he almost uh, scolds her for not interfering in his work for him morality is everything because he is not he is unable to even withstand the presence of uh, uh, a morally corrupt character 
then uh, you find uh, I mean Nora is unsuccessful and then Dr. Rank comes an important character that relationship is beautiful if you want to know the subplot of between Dr. Rank and Nora you have to read the play right. So, Dr. Rank reveals that he is about to die and uh, uh, Nora initially thinks of borrowing uh, money from Ranks to repay the money for uh, I mean that she owes to uh, Krogstad, but when she hears that Rank is uh, suffering from some kind of disease that he seemed to have inherited from his father, well she does not feel like asking him. And uh, of course, that is when uh, Mrs. Lynn comes Christine and when uh, Christine learns that Nora is in great trouble you know. So, she tells Nora do not worry I will try to help you because it seems in the past uh, uh, she was in uh, a kind of romantically in a relationship with Krogstad. So, she says let me see what I can do let me see what I can do I can help I can help uh, Krogstad not to pressurize you or something like that not to blackmail you. But uh, uh, of course, uh, this is a, an important thing then uh, then what happens here Crokestead comes and says that you know if she does not save I mean uh, you know uh, then uh, he is about to deliver the news to her husband that she had forged the letter and all that now Nora is absolutely unhappy, uh, but she is unable to uh, convince her husband to take him back and he is also she is also unable to convince him not to trouble her she does not know what to do you know and uh, now of course uh, in the meanwhile when she tries to pressurize her husband he has already dismissed he sends a dispatch as a letter of dismissal uh, and of course Krogstad comes and now what he says you know now he drops a letter in the mailbox of uh, Nora's husband wherein he has explained everything you know he has explained everything. Uh, now, when act 3 begins uh, uh, you know act 3 begins on a day after Christmas we find uh, Christine convincing uh, you know uh, Krogstad that he should not do it by then unfortunately Krogstad has already dropped a letter in the mailbox there is no way to retrieve that letter and Krogstad realizes the mistake and he says ok if it comes to that he will go and personally request the world not to take it to heart and all that. But, uh, uh, in the meanwhile Thorwald is about to open the letter, but Nora somehow convinces him not to open the letter until for some time you know because they have a, a ball to attend they have a dance party to attend and all that. So, Thorwald her husband promises her ok she he would open the letter a little later you know something like this. Now all that happens now of course, uh, this is when of course, Christine also tells uh, Krogstad that you know now that she is a widow and now that he is a widower they can marry each other and live a happy life why trouble the hammers and that is what that is I mean that convinces Krogstad. Uh, now of course, after the party uh, we uh, learn that uh, you know Torvald goes to his study and picks up the letter and now looking at the letter he is furious. He comes out and uh, scolds Nora like anything. He says, "You have uh, almost, you know, no sense of shame. You are morally depraved. How could you even think of writing a letter? I mean, forging your father's signature." Well, she tries to explain to him that it was to save his own life, but he doesn't understand all that, you know. So, what is otherwise an altruistic act by Nora to save the life of her husband becomes uh, a villainous act in 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 the eyes of her husband. So, he almost uh, shouts at her and says she is even unfit to be his wife, unfit to be the mother to his children and all that and she does not know what to do you know. She is about to you know she thinks of committing suicide and all that you know. So, that is what she says and now remember uh, what has happened Krogstad has uh, delivered another letter wherein of course, now Krogstad says that you know he is no longer interested in exposing Thorwald and he does not mind losing the job because anyhow it is going to his would be Christine therefore, he says he has forgiven everything. Now, the moment uh, you know Thorwald receives that he says he is again happy he says ok now do not worry you know do not bother Krogstad is not going to blackmail me I am saved and when I am saved you are saved something like this. But this is a moment of uh, reckoning this is a moment of awakening for Nora. In fact, until now this point of time 
Nora was under the impression that uh, he is more concerned about uh, you know the standards of morality, conscience and all that. But now she realizes that uh, her husband is nothing more than a self obsessed uh, prick you know all that his concern was not because you know for any sense of morality because he was scared that uh, you know his name would be spoiled and Crookstead would blackmail him. Once he learns that Crookstead has forgiven him, he forgets all the issues of morality and tries to you know talk to Nora in the very old way you know my little darling, uh, you my little bird and all that. Of course, that is when uh, you know uh, our protagonist has learnt that you know uh, her value in the family. It is uh, not because he likes her, not because of her individual worth, but because it suits him. Okay. So, she is even disillusioned with uh, the character. Until that point of time, she thought that uh, this guy is morally upright, therefore, she has done some kind of a mistake. Now, she realizes that all that he cared was, was saving his skin at the expense of you know his wife's reputation. She thinks this is time. Therefore, when the play ends, she almost uh, says that no I will no longer live with you and she, when Thorwald tries to convince her no you have kids you have responsibility she says no you take care of the kids just a while ago you shouted at me saying that I am unfit to raise my children you may be right but uh, you know I have a more than my duty as a mother and wife I have a duty towards myself and therefore in order to understand myself better. I am walking out of this family, I am walking out of this relationship, you can take care of the kids, the nanny can take care of the kids saying that you know she walks out of the house you know with a, a bang on the door and later of course you know and therefore, the play ends with Nora exiting. So, the loud, the loud sound of door shutting is heard heralding an onset of a journey that uh, Nora undertakes wherein this journey takes her from illusion to illumination that is what a critic says. Okay. This is in nutshell what happens in the in the play right. Uh, of course, many debates can take place whether she was justified in leaving uh, her husband, her family, her duties what is all this we can pick up a critical discussion on that in the next class all right. Please read the play and then of course, you would understand the play all the more better. We will meet you in the next class.